Welcome. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock, your host. Happy Tuesday. Thank you for joining me. Hope you're having a great week. Hope you're having a great Tuesday. We're going to try to brighten your Tuesday with an awesome, fantastic show today. We have something on tap for you. Shamika Michelle is going to join us. Delano Squires is going to join us, as will Steve Kim. We will talk, uh, <laughs> shockingly, well, I told you this yesterday, so you won't be shocked. I got a take about Barbie, the movie Barbie. Uh, I've got a take about that that I'm going to get off my chest first. We'll talk with Shamika Michelle about that. We'll talk with Delano about that, because my take is a bit different and moves into the whole manosphere discussion and, and all that. I, I'll, I'll unpack it all in a fire starter and then we'll end the show with Steve Kim and we will get to the discussion of uh, Bronny James, LeBron James' son who's uh, about to be a freshman at USC. He collapsed uh, yesterday in practice, suffered cardiac arrest. He's in stable condition today. Everybody's speculating about what this means and the vax and all that. We'll discuss it with Steve Kim. Uh, at the end of today's show, so stay tuned for all of that. But uh, without further ado, let's get right to the fire star and let us get this great show uh, started early. Uh, there's nothing subtle about the messaging in the box office hit Barbie. It opens with an abortion scene. Little girls violently smash and dismember baby dolls as a way of rejecting motherhood in favor of their preferred, career-oriented Barbie doll. The Margot Robbie-fronted blockbuster spends the next two hours casting the patriarchy as the bane of American society. Barbie is another superhero movie. It's Wonder Woman and Black Panther in high heels, a movie meant to engender alliance among hardcore feminists, women of color, and attractive suburban white women. Barbie Land is the new Wakanda for recovering pick me girls. It's a fantasy world where emancipated women rule a utopian paradise free of the expectations and ideas of men. Like uh, the Black Panther movies, the popularity of Barbie is attached to the grievance it expresses. White colonizers destroyed Africa. That's the underlying gist of Black Panther. White men destroyed America. That's the gist of Barbie. The real point of both movie franchises is that men destroyed the world. Most people miss this point in the Black Panther. They fail to recognize that in the original Black Panther, Chadwick Boseman's T'Challa character simply followed the instructions of women. In the sequel, with T'Challa dead, his sister and a band of female warriors saved the planet. Hollywood is hammering a consistent theme. Men, regardless of color, owe women a debt. That's the point of Barbie. Men saddled women with the burden of motherhood. We designed a culture that teaches women that their primary value is their ability to reproduce and nurture the human that grows in their womb. This forced responsibility impeded women from reaching far bigger and more impactful aspirations. Men have bought these lies and distortions. We've spent more than 100 years paying reparations to the feminist movement for crimes we absolutely did not commit. Male guilt is the emotion driving much of the insanity we see around gender ideology, cancel culture, and the sexualization of kids. We've been convinced that the key to writing the world is for men to adopt the mindset and values of women. We've been hoodwinked into overemphasizing feelings. Hurting someone's feelings is now a capital offense. Words are as deadly as sticks and stones. It's not true, not in a man's world. It's also equally untrue that men constructed a sexist society. Men constructed a society that allowed for and promoted the, advance, the advancements that allow women to pretend they're the equal of men. If you removed trains, planes, and automobiles, the inventions of men, and we returned to traveling by feet and horseback, the feminist movement would disappear tomorrow. 
Take away skyscrapers and other tall buildings that allow us to live in cities, and the feminist movement would disappear. If we still lived on farms and in rural areas, women would not complain about a lack of equality. Women did not build skyscrapers. They weren't the roughnecks who fell to their deaths building the hotels and office spaces we now take for granted. The patriarchy has been unbelievably fair to women. On average, men live seven less years than women. Men sacrifice their lives for the comfort of women. That has always been the case. We die in war. We honor the value of a woman's womb and her ability to reproduce life through the sacrifice of our own lives. Again, the Barbie movie opens with a rejection of motherhood. It argues that being a lawyer or an astronaut or doctor is far more important than being a mother. It's a ridiculous assertion. No other life form devalues motherhood the way modern feminists do. Motherhood is a supernatural power. The messaging coming from Hollywood, Barbie, and the feminist movement is anti-life. It's satanic. What other way is there to describe consistent messaging hostile to reproduction? Men have to quit apologizing for our history, particularly here in America. Our guilt and shame are being used to destroy this country. Men took incredible risk and suffered death so that women and former slaves could live free here in America. The people complaining the loudest and, re and producing art that demonizes men would not make those kinds of sacrifices. They don't even understand sacrifice. They stand on the graves of our ancestors and feign victimhood to acquire power. They're cowards. They create fantasy worlds such as Barbie Land and Wakanda because they don't have the courage, values, and faith necessary to build anything that rivals America. Dressing up in pink outfits and dashikis and going to a movie allows them to feel like courageous men and women fighting oppression. It's embarrassing. It exposes their delusion and the, ne and the necessity of patriarchal rulership. That's my fire starter. We have to quit apologizing. Men, we have nothing to apologize for. We have to quit going for the victimhood and thinking there's some uh, value in pandering to people and treating people as victims. They're not victims. And I'm talking about, because there's a synergy. And the reason why I connected Black Panther and Barbie Land, or Barbie, to each other, is there's great synergy here. There's great synergy in messaging here. Again, a lot of people, the message of the Black Panther went over their head because they're so caught up in the racial idolatry that is at the heart of the popularity of the Black Panther. Oh, look at what, what black people would have built and we would have had this perfect world if it wasn't for the white colonizers. And many people think that's the gist of the Black Panther franchise of movies. But it, it's really about the matriarchy and matriarchal rulership. It was there in the first one, went over people's head, that all T'Challa did was what his mama, sister, and all the other women told him to do. That dude was handpicked. That dude was a puppet of women. He was soft. He, he did nothing spectacular. The women just manipulated him, and he, and he was like a chess piece that women moved around. Go rewatch the movie. That was a movie about men obeying women. And look how great things would be. When they came back with the second one, after Chadwick Boseman is dead, and, and under the excuse of, well, Chadwick Boseman's dead, we can't replace him with another man, let's move on, and his sister is now the Black Panther. 
and she's 120 pounds running around beating up all men all over the planet. And whoever that uh, the Latino dude or Mexican dude that played the guy, the fish man, Aquaman, whatever he was, she done took him on and and her and all the other Amazon female warriors. You know, this was the precursor for the woman king. They saved the planet. They saved Wakanda. They're the greatest thing since sliced bread. All of these movies, The Woman King, The Black Panther, and Barbie all have the same theme. If men weren't here, look at how great things would be. You're going for this, and we are going for this. And that's why we have built an entire society and an entire culture built around how people feel. For the most part, a properly functioning man cares about results and advancement. He doesn't care about feelings. Sticks and stones will break his bones, but words will never harm him. We know that's not true for women. It, that's even pointed out in Barbie land. Oh, if you just get rid of men, no one will ever say anything that hurts your feelings and you won't have to deal with their expectations and all of their mixed messaging, blah, blah, blah. We have built a world based around feelings and protecting people's feelings. Oh my God, you wrote a song or you said something that might be offensive and oh, it reminds black people of slavery and oh, you must lose your job. You're terrible. This is a bridge too far. You've hurt someone's feelings. They have feminized the entire culture. And as I've talked about on this show, when you start injecting women, and particularly these feminist women, into every conversation, it changes everything. It moves you away from the truth and the expression of truth to expressing something that doesn't hurt someone's sensibilities or alleged feelings, doesn't allow people to pretend offense, fake offense. It moves you away from stating the truth. And that's why we're in a society and a culture that's so defined by lies and untruths. Because again, we're, we're sitting around paralyzed. Oh my God, by telling Jason he's fat, I may hurt his feelings and therefore I'll pretend like Lizzo isn't fat and that she's gorgeous and beautiful and perfectly healthy. That's the world that they've created. And so now we tell ugly people, oh, how beautiful they are. We tell fat people, oh, how healthy they are and how attractive they are. And Lizzo, put this thong on and run around on stage making a fool of yourself. And, we're, and, and people are applauding this in great massive numbers. This is what happens when you turn over society to women. I know I'll sound like a sexist pig in this society. Someone worthy of being canceled, but it's just facts. And it's biblical facts. Men were given the responsibility of dominion over the earth and everything that creepeth and crawleth on the earth. The, the, I didn't make this up. And it was very effective. So effective, the patriarchy and male rulership, that the country that stuck to just a few of the biblical principles spelled out in the Bible and allowed men to rule and lead became the envy of the world. And all of these people that are complaining, wh whoever this woman is, that girl wig, I can't even remember the woman's name that put on this Barbie movie to uh, Ryan Coogler that did the Black Panther, all these people complaining about America. You couldn't get them out of here at gunpoint. You couldn't get them to leave America with sticks of dynamite planted in their rear end. 
They wouldn't let, well, let it blow up. I'd still rather be here in America. But I'm supposed to believe and you're supposed to believe the men that built this country and the system that they're, that they're the most wicked, evilest people in the history of the planet. And we must undo everything that they created so that women can rule. So that uh, we, we have school systems where little kids go and if, if they're confused or their teacher has convinced them of something or the culture has pressured them into, oh, I'm a little boy, but I feel like a, I feel like a woman. Everything stops on a dime and we all react to people's feelings and we all start treating people based on their feelings, not reality, not truth, not what will advance the culture, but what will make someone feel good in that moment. That's not how you advance. Again, any man will tell you, any athlete will tell you, man or woman, no pain, no gain. Making people feel good creates a soft, vulnerable society that descends further and further into chaos, into people being ruled by emotions. And so they're making these movies uh, to create, to, to take us further into delusion and into fantasy world where, where, I mean, people are actually operating and making decisions. These movies are dangerous. They're not harmless because they feed a delusion that people are actually acting upon. I'm gonna give you an example. It's like all these movies that, that they put out over the last 10 years centered around uh, uh, black people and police violence, creating this delusion that Oh man, the average black man, whew, oh my God, if he goes out into the streets, there's no telling if he'll come home because the police may kill him. And, and, and we've made decisions and started making rules and laws and, and customs and normalized a, a fear of police that's unhealthy and actually leads to more chaos and a disrespect for police that has made our neighborhoods less safe. All because we walked into and leaned into the delusion that police are just out here randomly killing black men, unarmed black men for doing nothing. So they already have you living in the matrix on many, many issues. And one of the biggest deals they have us bought into in the matrix is that men owe women some great debt and you better bend over backwards. You better support Title IX. You better pay uh, the women's soccer team uh, more money than the men's soccer team. You better pay these WNBA players uh, even if their league loses tens of millions of dollars every year, you better start getting them private planes and you better pay them more money because they deserve it because you owe them. None of this is logical. It doesn't make sense. It's not sustainable. But these movies and the corporate media and what they keep pumping out keeps making us abandon the real world for these false narratives that they promote. And then we make decisions based on these false narratives. Men, over the course of history, there is no argument to be made that we have systemically, systematically mistreated women. The opposite is actually true. Our treatment of women has gotten better and better and better over time. We're not in the caveman days. No one in America is knocking women over the heads and dragging them off to have their way with them. As it relates to race, slavery is over. Jim Crow is over. We made sacrifices sacrificed our lives 
for the freedom of slaves and black people. Protested and changed laws and gave, sacrificed our lives to end Jim Crow and segregation and much of the unfairness that ruled America at one time. America and men, particularly in America, have granted freedom to more and more and more people and made this America more and more fair to the point we've gone the other direction now. The, the, the little gimmick of, oh my God, you colonizers, you uh, sexist men, you owe us because a hundred years ago we couldn't vote. And because 70 years ago, uh, you know, my great, great, my great grandfather couldn't go to the school of his choice. So you owe me. World doesn't owe you anything. And people made sacrifices to end those standards, practices, those uh, normalized customs. That, that was fixing that was payment of the debt. And, and th this is my last little point, and I'll, this is something I want to talk with <laughs> Delano about, and it, it's, it's, it's just where this whole conversation about Barbie Land and Black Panther and all this, it takes me, and, and all these little gimmicks and schemes that they've put in to, to prey on the guilt of men in general and white men in particular. But, but, but Here's the hustle as it really, on, on the racial aspect of this, this whole obsession we now have with African-American history, alleged African-American history. It's not about history, for the most part, is about the retelling of the triumphs that man has had. Oh, for this Neil Armstrong, he walked on the moon, or so-and-so did X, Y, and Z. The Wright brothers invented airplanes. That's what history is. But because of this guilt thing we've been running on America, when it comes to black history, it's always tragedy. Oh, there was the Tulsa massacre. It's not a story about what did the black business people do in Tulsa to make a so-called Black Wall Street. It's not the story of how they rebuilt that within a decade after the alleged Tulsa massacre. That would be history that, that would be worthy of being taught and would inspire people and teach people how you actually build something. That's what history is. But we've turned it, well, the Tulsa, it's, it's just about the massacre. It's about what white people did to black people. That's the history that needs to be taught. The people that laid the impediments, that's the real story. And it, again, it's a teaching of a victim's mentality, but what it really is, all, what their real obsession is, what the 1619 Project is, what all of it is, they should quit calling it history and call it excuses. African-American excuses, that's what they want to be taught. They don't want to tell stories about what we did and accomplished. They want to tell stories about what was done to us. And they want to do that as an excuse because all of these people are primarily affirmative action beneficiaries of, they got led into some Ivy League school when their test scores didn't uh, demand that, didn't qualify for them for that. Many of them got jobs where they hadn't put the work in and they know their affirmative action hires. And so what they want taught is African-American excuses so that if anyone questions, hey, you questioning why I'm at Harvard? Have you, have you studied African-American excuses? That's why my test score wasn't this high. Oh, you're questioning why I got this promotion on the job? You should study African-American excuses. Then you would know that even though I'm not as qualified as you, I deserve this job if you understood African-American excuses. Excuses are like buttholes. Everyone has one and they all stink. 
And if, if we as men don't develop the courage, I'm talking about all, to, to one, look at what's really going on. They got us bogged down in this little race war, but that's not really what's going on. We have a gender war going on. Who's going to rule America? The patriarchy or the matriarchy? You can be an idiot and side with the matriarchy. I'm not. I'm not, and I'm not going to apologize for not wanting a matriarchy and not understanding the foolishness of the matriarchy. If you're not man enough to look out into the world, if you're not woman enough to look out into the world and look at the most matriarchal culture we have here in America is run by black women. Go look at the results. Go watch that Sukihana video. Go look at the test scores of young black boys and our achievement rates. That's what the matriarchy will get you. We are the lab rats for the matriarchy. It's been a disaster. You can live in denial and confusion and stupidity and not see it. I'm not going to. The matriarchy doesn't work. So run off to Barbie land, run off to Wakanda, buy into the false narrative and apply all the, oh my God, these butch women, if they could just get in control of the world, things will be so much better. Go to the hood and see how that's working out. Oh, if these fat obese, and I'm fat and obese, but if these fat women, if they could just be in charge, if they would set the beauty standard, we'd all be dead a lot earlier. Those are just the facts. All right, uh, that's my addition to my fire starter. Uh, before we bring in Shamika Michelle, I want to tell you guys about uh, how I've been cleaning my home and how my mother's been cleaning her home. Are you tired of all the cleaning products you use around the house always smelling like nasty chemicals? Would you rather be using something that not only smelled better but was made out of natural products that you could trust as well? If you would, I recommend you check out Naturally It's Clean. Their products are made with hospital grade cleaning solutions that are going to smell great every time. For instance, Bob Vila says that Naturally It's Clean has the most eco-friendly carpet stain remover on the market today. And it's Bob Vila, so you can kind of take that to the bank. I personally love Naturally It's Clean. I use it at my home, my mother uses it at hers. Their essential starter kit, which features four of their most popular products, is one of their top selling items, and you can get 15% off for a limited time when you go to naturallyisclean.com slash fearless. These products are manufactured here in the US of A. They support your conservative values. I've met Wynn Fisher, this is his company. He's one of us, he lives in Fort Wayne. We hit it off as fellow Hoosiers. This guy supports what we think. You have an opportunity to support a company that backs your values. They offer free two-day shipping. Please check them out today and get your Jason's Essential Starter Kit by going to naturallyitsclean.com slash fearless. That's naturallyitsclean.com slash fearless. When you go to their website, you're going to see Allie Best Stucky everywhere. She recommends the product. You don't have to take my word for it. And if you're not the decision maker in your home, if your wife or girlfriend or whoever made, makes these type decisions, let them know to go to naturallyisclean.com slash fearless and get their cleaning essentials there. This stuff works. It's, it's eco-friendly. It's friendly to kids. You can trust this product, and it backs your values. All right, you can email me and us at fearlessblazeshow at gmail.com. Meet Michelle next. It's my obligation or hate discrimination raising up your hands for freedom. All right, welcome back. Uh, we're gonna roll out to North Carolina, bring in Shamika Michelle. She, like me, spent part of yesterday 
uh, watching the Barbie movie. Uh, <clears throat> Shmeek, I'm glad you went. I was worried I wouldn't have anybody to talk to that actually saw the movie. Uh, glad to get a female perspective. I could be just dead wrong here and just, but man, did I struggle. Every 15 minutes, I wanted to leave. I don't sit through bad movies, but I knew I had to talk about this. I didn't find the movie funny. I, did, I certainly didn't find the narrative plot compelling. I thought it was preachy, and I thought it was over the top. And, and I, 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 I can't think of a redeeming quality I found in the movie. What did you think? In the words of men on film, hated it. I hated the movie. I hated it so much. It was the gayest thing I've seen since Sausage Party. And I talked about this last week. I did not like the movie at all. And actually, I didn't intend on going to see it until you mentioned that you wanted to see it and talk about it. I mentioned that to my children who said, Mom, we, we want to see the movie. So I said, OK. I didn't like it at all. And it's not lost on me, Jason. I don't think you mentioned this in your monologue. There was one guy who I guess was supposed to be non-binary, who wasn't a Ken or a Barbie, who was Alex or something his name was. I noticed that. And I just hated the movie all around, especially when Ken wanted to spend the night with Barbie and he was thinking, you know, we could hang out together. And she was like, no, it's girls night. It's girls night every night. Where they do that at? I would never turn down a man for a group of women. Like the, the message that it sent was the usual, as you said, demonizing the patriarchy and just demonizing me and all around. I hated it. What did your daughters think? My daughter said it ruined her childhood because Barbie and Ken are supposed to be together. She just couldn't understand why they would say, you know, Barbie said, I'm not in love with Ken. What do you mean? You've been in love with Ken for 40, 50 years. And so she didn't like it. The other one said it was the worst movie she had seen in a long time. They didn't like it at all. And for me, I am such a big Barbie fan. I didn't even grow up with a father in the home. Yet I had a lot of Barbies and I had a lot of a lot of kids. We would change their names and they were always together. Even though I didn't have that example, naturally I knew that men and women are supposed to be together. So for them to do a movie with what a lot of young girls, what we played with and the way we saw family and go against that, I just didn't like that aspect of it at all because I, I mean, me and my friends would set up our little Barbie houses and Barbie towns and we would play Barbie like if we were spending the night. One of my friends, we would play Barbie all night long and we never had our Barbies disrespecting the cans. It was just a known fact that they were family. Even when they came out with the little Barbie babies, the little babies, and they had the little family with the car, this was just the way that it was. And so for them to come out here in 2023 and Barbie is not attracted to Ken, she doesn't like Ken, Ken is feeling like he has no place because, you know, he, he's saying his life is nothing without Barbie. And she's telling him, oh, Ken, you need to find yourself without me. It sucked. It sucks so bad. I wish that I had just stuck to my guns and not watched it. <laughs> I read a lot of reviews that did not make a p the point that I made at the beginning of my review, that the opening scene was an abortion scene. And that I don't know if that's what you were thinking, but as soon as they did it, I mean, they had a little child, like a five or six, seven year old, taking her Barbie doll and just beating it. and destroying the head and beating up other Barbies and dismembering this man. And I was like, oh my God, this is, and, and they did it in reaction to like, 
the point, the narrator and everybody's like saying that, you know, little girls used to get these baby dolls so they could practice the art of being a mother. And then the Barbie dolls came and they could, they could be all these other things, astronauts, dentists, whatever. And so they all went to destroying their babies to pursue being a Barbie doll. And I was like, this is an abortion analogy right out the gate. Did it strike you the same way? I didn't think of the word abortion, but I did notice that, okay, they're telling little girls, you don't need to practice being a mom or you don't need to see this baby as your child and let's destroy this and let's bring in this other doll that's a Barbie doll that's going to be perfect and, you know, live this life. My Barbies were still mothers. So for me, even though I wasn't carrying around a baby doll, my Barbies were still wives and mothers. So maybe this whole, you know, I don't remember the whole astronauts and all of that stuff for Barbies. We had Barbie in the rocker, but my Barbies, no matter what package they came in, were still wives or girlfriends or, you know, this was just the way it was for me. But yes, me and my kids, when they sat there and cracked the baby dolls on the ground and the heads exploded, we sat there like, oh my, oh my goodness, what in the world? You know, because it was such a graphic scene and it was sending the message, get rid of thinking these babies are yours. Get rid of trying to prepare for motherhood. Get rid of that thought we have something better for you. And so that is exactly the message it was sending. And I, I just thought it was a bad movie. And so yesterday when I went to go see it, I knew a little bit of what the movie was about. But before yesterday, I had some false thoughts and hopes about, I saw the commercials and, and I thought, oh, this movie's going to be humorous. And one of my favorite, and I'm not ashamed to admit this, but one of my favorite movies that features, that's kind of like a chick flick, that's, is Clueless. I, I love the movie Clueless. It's hilarious, it cracks me up. And I thought this was going to be like a different version of Clueless. And, and, <sighs> I just did nothing in the movie made me laugh. And there were a good number of people in the theater who I would imagine were all there for different reasons than me and, and, and enjoyed the movie. But I didn't hear anybody in the theater laughing. And, and I've read reviewers that talk about, oh, there was this funny scene and that funny scene. I just, nothing made me laugh in the movie. Did, did you find anything humorous? It wasn't funny to me. I was actually restless, like just, you know, kept shifting in my seat, waiting for it to, to go off. Like, when is this going to end? Because it wasn't funny. And I like Issa Rae. I thought her show Insecure was pretty good. There were a lot of funny parts in, in that show. She wasn't even funny to me. And so, no, I didn't think it was funny. It, it certainly wasn't anywhere near Clueless because that was a really good movie. It, it just wasn't funny. Even the parts that I guess were supposed to be funny, like when they came into the real world and the humans were picking on them, it was just it was just silly to me. And I feel like they could have given us a better storyline. You know, they had to save the world, you know, save Barbie land because the men had taken over because Ken came back from the real world and wanted to do something different. It, I just did not like the message that it sent to young girls and having young girls of my own who watched it and said, this is terrible. It proved to me, and I'm thankful that everybody's not buying into the feminist message, but I know there are so many young women who are, who just will decide, I don't want to be married. I don't want to have kids. And that is why we are here. And honestly, I feel like you don't have a very fulfilling life as a woman if you miss those things. 
Tamika, thank you so much. We'll see you tomorrow. Great job as always. Uh, guys, I, if you're like me and you want to get in shape, one of the biggest obstacles for me is getting to the gym. That's why I got a gym in my home. And Echelon Fitness is now a big part of my home gym. Echelon Fitness is the affordable way to get the workout equipment, the workout community, and an instructor's motivation right in the comfort and privacy of your home. Echelon Fitness offers a full range of affordable workout equipment, including stationary bikes, smart rowers, sleek fitness screens, and the auto-folding treadmill. I've got the one of these high-end Echelon bikes that hooks me up with instructors all over the internet. It's, it's awesome, and it's a part of my workout routine now. <clears throat> with Echelon Fitness, you can work out anytime at home and crush your fitness goals. Echelon Fitness app provides you with over 1,500 live classes a month and offers over 15,000 round-the-clock on-demand classes with world-class instructors and great music from your favorite artists. Plus, with Echelon, one membership covers a family of five. Text FEARLESS to 818181 to get $200 off your new Echelon. Just text FEARLESS to 818181, that's Terrell Owens, three times, to get this special discount, plus free shipping and risk-free 30-day returns. Text FEARLESS to 818181. Terrell Owens, three times, get $200 off. Join me in my bid and my weight loss journey. You can join me on Echelon. I'll be on the bike. You be on the treadmill or whatever you, the, the rower, whatever. Join the Echelon community. They support us, they support our values. And you know, for those of us that are, what are aren't those of us that are obsessed with getting in shape, or aren't we right wing Nazis or whatever? Echelon, they're, they're, they're not afraid to join us crazy right wing people who actually think being healthy is a good thing. Join us. All right, get your Fearless Army swag at shopblazemedia.com slash fearless. Lamo Squires. All right, welcome back. Uh, time to bring in Professor D. Get a little smarter in this conversation. Uh, we're gonna roll out to Washington, D.C., bring in Delano Squires, who uh, I believe is recovering from COVID. Uh, he's at home today, he looks healthy to me. Uh, Delano, uh, I know you haven't had a chance to see Barbie, and hopefully you won't mm -hmm. ever see the movie Barbie. Uh, <laughs> but uh, for me, it's just another Hollywood production that attacks mm. the patriarchy and, and male rulership or patriarchal uh, society. And mm -hmm. I'm just not going to apologize for being a supporter of the patriarchy. I, I don't have any guilt about it. Uh, should we have some? And, 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 you know, have we been unfair to women? Perhaps, you know, I'm being too unsympathetic and, and overlooking all the atrocities men have committed towards women. Well, Jason, I, I think, I mean, life is complicated. And, and I'll say this as a Christian, I understand that everyone, um, is capable and commit sin, right? So this is not, there's no special class of people who get away unscathed. And, and one of the things that sort of a more a biblical perspective will give you is an understanding that when God gives instructions to those in authority, he also gives instructions to those under, under authority. But, but when you're the person in authority, part of what he says is to govern and steward this authority well, because your, your nature will be to take advantage of it. Um, so to that extent, do I think that there are certain things that men have done to women? Sure, of course. Um, and, and this could be specific men, right? So if 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 Papa knows his is the only income, he said, look, I'll, I may come home on Friday night or I may not. And there's not much you can do about it, right? 
But the same thing exists for women. And to the extent that children typically fall under the, the leadership and governorship of, of their mothers, um, there are ways in which, you know, women, in, individual, let's say sp- specifically individuals, mm-hmm. have abused that authority. Um, you, you know that Barbie opens basically with uh, an abortion scene with little girls saying, I, I don't want to be a mother. Being a mother is not important to me. I'd much rather chase after whatever the men are doing. And part of what happens with that particular mindset is 900,000 babies being aborted each year. Now, we don't look at that as an abuse of female authority, but that's exactly what it is because if women say, look, I'm the only one who can decide what happens to my body. And that decision leads to another body with unique DNA being killed and sacrificed at the altar of either convenience or corporate climbing. Uh, that's exactly how I think we should look at it. So I don't think men as a, as a group of people should be in the business of apologizing for things that they did not do. Um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, we all don't, you know, aren't accountable for our own individual actions. And that's something I would always say that people should be accountable for the things that they do, not spend their life trying to pay off debts that people they don't know and have no connection to have run up. You know, I, I, I gave a talk this past weekend where I made this analogy. Uh, someone made the argument that that America hasn't lived up to all of its promises. And, and, and that they said a little bit more than that, but that was the gist of, uh, you know, we can all agree America hasn't lived up to his, uh, all of its promises, so therefore America must do X, Y, and Z and owes X, Y, and Z debt. And, and I came back and made the rebuttal of, hey, look, America is just a reflection of the humanity that lives within our borders. And Mm. humanity is all fallen, men and women. And so uh, men and women fall short. So America, of course, is going to fall short. And I was like, the better way to look at things is like, uh, hey, many of you guys here, you're married. Uh, Your spouse, I'm sure, Mm. has made some promises (laughs) that that he or she hasn't lived up to. And, and you're wise enough, many of you that are in successful marriages, to say, you know what? They haven't lived up to everything they promised and, and they haven't been perfect. But on the whole, man, this marriage and relationship has served me well. So I'm going to stick with it and, and I'm going to have a positive outlook on it. I go, that's the same as America. And so I think women should say, you know, well, you know, in the 1940s and 50s, when we started entering the workplace, did Don Draper and the Mad Men uh, perhaps not adjust to us joining the workforce the way that they should have? Absolutely, and where some awful things perhaps went on in some isolated or maybe even pervasive way. But overall, I just think if you look at what men have done in sacrifice for women, you got to be able to land on that, uh, you know, for the most part, I want to stick with this. This has been good. And I I tend to say the same as it relates to women. If men look back at how we've been treated by women, for the most part, we'd have to say, no, this has been good. Let's keep trying it. Let's keep doing it. But, 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 the people on the extremes, the complainers, seem to be moving the culture, culture to a point where we're just all pointing the fingers at each other and saying, you're the problem, you're to blame, yeah. shut up, you're all wrong. Uh, the extremes seem to be winning the debate rather than the rational. And I think one of the one of the byproducts that we don't talk enough about when it comes to, you know, quote unquote, wokeness is it's sort of inherent um, ingratitude. Right. It sows seeds of ingratitude within the people who practice it, because, you know, for people who take on that mindset, it's never, um, you know, oh, I benefited from these 80 things. It's I didn't have access to these 20 things that I really wanted. Um, and it makes people ungrateful. And ungrateful people are by nature bitter, right? 
Um, they're all they're envious, they're jealous. Um, they they rarely are contented, rarely peaceful, rarely ever sort of evoke any sense of joy. Um, and I, and I think you see this even in some of the commentary right around the battle of the sexes. Um, and and I'm glad you use that example in terms of marriage. I mean, anybody who's watched Tyler Perry's, you know, why did I get married? Flick remembers the 80 20 rule. And he basically said some guys will leave a woman who give, who's given them 80 percent of what they want to chase the 20 percent of what they what they think they, they aren't getting. And in, and in doing so, they will destroy themselves and their family for 20 percent and 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 not be grateful for the 80 percent. So I, I think there's there's definitely that dynamic there. But the other thing and, and, and particularly in this day and age, the ultimate irony is that women who spent an entire life complaining about the patriarchy are the primary ones turning around and submitting to the patriarchy. Because when a new group of dudes comes on the block and says, look, we're writing the rules of womanhood now. And if, and if you want to stay in our good graces and the good graces of, of you know, your tribe, you better tell us, right? Now, there may be some, some junk slipping out in the nether regions. And they say, you better tell me that I'm a woman. And if you don't affirm how feminine I am with my deep voice and Adam's apple and 26-inch biceps and 21-inch neck, if you don't affirm my femininity, I'm going to call you a transphobe and a bigot and a person serving white supremacy. And, and, and the culture is going to cancel you. Uh, so now you have a group of women who walk around on eggshells terrified of offending um, the impossible women, like, you know, whether it's uh, Admiral Rachel Levine or, or anybody else um, uh, who, who, who claims to be a woman, right? These, these women are terrified of these guys. And now I think many women are understanding that the natural order and God's design for nature is undefeated because they... They wanted the power they thought came with being a man, but none of the responsibility. And one of those two major responsibilities for any decent dude is to provide and to protect. And the woman said, oh, I could, I could provide for myself, no biggie. But, but what they don't understand is that testosterone is not a social construct. So when these, when these other guys who pretend to be women that have all of that coursing through their veins, show up on the scene and they start to press their advantage and get ultra aggressive with, with, with actual females. Now they're running scared. And eventually what they'll turn back and do, they'll either submit to these men or they'll say, Hey, Jason Delano, can you offer me some level of protection? And, and hopefully, you know, men will, will be gracious. Cause again, I, I started with a biblical perspective, hopefully that repentance and turning from, from their ways and, and seeking uh, to live in accordance with God desi- God's design will be met with grace and compassion from 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 guys like us. So you did see the movie Black Panther. You, I'm going to assume you saw them both. Yes. Uh, and, and so, <clears throat> what do you think of my assertion that the underlying theme of both Black Panther movies was? anti-patriot, anti-patriarchy, and really about uh, feminine empowerment, female empowerment? I mean, I, I definitely agree with that assessment, um, particularly Black, the second Black Panther. I mean, it was, I mean, once, once obviously, Chadwick Boseman tragically passed away, once they wrote his character out, I mean, they, they really let loose on, on, on the matriarchy. Um, but yeah, I think both of them, you know, speak to to sort of the the black feminist utopia of female rule, and the the irony of the first Black Panther is that it's possible to have female rule when a, a man sort of is in that um, put in in sort of the the primary position of leadership. It's the same thing you see in the black church, right? Where yes, the pastor is a man, but all the people who are running things, whether it's the different ministries or telling him what to do or ensuring that he doesn't cross, you know, specific boundaries um, are women. And that's why a lot of pastors may think personally, no, I don't think women should, should be, you know, allowed to um, be, be elders or shepherds or bishops according, according to the Bible, but they'll never say that because these guys don't want to have that 
that particular fight. So, so yeah, I think Black Panther, Woman King, Black Panther 2, all have, particularly Black Panther and Woman King, have men in that, um, so in the role of king and leader, but it's clear that those movies are promoting, you know, a BLM uh, utopia. And so I think this is all part of a calculated strategy where many of us think, you know, because we haven't given it a lot of thoughts. Oh, it's just a movie. It's just fantasy. It's not the real world. But the mindset and the themes, the, the, the point I was trying to make is like, okay, everybody knows that Barbie isn't real and the Wakanda isn't real, but, but everybody also knows if they really, really examine it's like, hey man, uh, the police aren't executing a genocide on unarmed mm. black men. The, the numbers just don't support that. But we make decisions and institute policies as if that's really going on and that's where I think the danger of Barbie mm. land and Wakanda and the, the whole anti-male mentality, we're making decisions based off these fantasy narratives. Yeah, and, and what you really see, Jason, is a, a complete lack of honesty on, the, on behalf of people who sort of examine the culture. Because in one breath, they'll say um, films, TV, music, other forms of media are very important when it comes to representation, right? So they, they tell a story, they tell a narrative, and we should pay attention to that because, you know, everybody needs to see themselves in these movies. And then when you critique what the, the, the movies actually say and what they promote, then they say, oh, you're just, you're just overblowing it. Conservatives just don't like pop culture. These movies aren't really real. Nobody's paying attention to it. And I, I don't think that those two messages are logically reconcilable. So I, I'm a person that believes that um, media and mass culture is critically important. Um, I mean, it, it's how, in, in, in the best case scenario, it's how governments promote positive propaganda, right? So it could be a sense of natu nationalism, patriotism. But then in the worst case scenario, it's how enemies sow division within a, within a particular country. They'll, they'll use anything that people can, you know, you know, foreign adversaries will use anything that they can get their hands on. And if you feed people poison for long enough, um, they'll, they'll kill their own golden goose. So again, if you want to talk about logically irreconcilable positions, the, the left will say that America is a racist, white supremacist, xenophobic, homophobic, transphobic, sexist um, country from top to bottom, root to branch. But then they'll also say, we want all of the world's brown people. We want more um, LGBTQIA2 plus MA, MAP people. We want all of the people who we say get a raw deal in this country to come to this country. So those two things don't make sense. If it was really that bad, you wouldn't want anybody to come here. And in fact, if it was really that bad, we would see a mass exodus out of this place. But that's not really what the case is. They, they want to use... Um, these creations of mass culture um, to push their own, you know, a, agenda, and and obviously a big part of that is is anti male and anti patriarchy. Thank you, Delano. Uh, hope you and your family are feeling better. Uh, keep uh, taking that vitamin D and zinc. All right, that's uh, Delano <laughs> Squires. Uh, we're going to roll out to Los Angeles, bring in the Korean Cosell, talk some Bronny James and cardiac arrest uh, with Steve Kim next. All right, welcome back. Time to roll out to Los Angeles. Bring in Steve Kim, the star of the show. Uh, we're going to end the show. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I wanted to cover it. We're off, way off into speculation land. 
as it relates to Bronny James, uh, LeBron James' son, who is going to be a freshman at USC. He collapsed yesterday uh, during some workouts, suffered cardiac arrest, is now in stable condition. Of course, almost immediately, speculation turns to the vaccine and myocarditis. People are sending out uh, old stories of LeBron James saying that, you know, I took the vax and I thought it was best for me and my entire family. Uh, Steve, uh, is it fair? Should we be instantly discussing the vaccine as it relates to Bronny James and his unfortunate collapse, cardiac arrest yesterday? Well, good afternoon, Jason. Well, in terms of this story, number one, first and foremost, your thoughts go out to the James family. No matter what we think of LeBron and some of his stances or even our opinions of him as an athlete, first and foremost, you hope that he has a son that is living a normal functioning life and you care about his health. Um, now, in relationship to all that you mentioned, there is a time and a place in my view, and you can make a judgment or anyone can about when is it too soon. Based on what has happened and transpired in our country the last three years and how this issue was politicized and, according to some, jammed down our throats, yes, you can question it. You could say it's, it's too early, okay, but what's the cutoff point? Is it 24 hours grace period? Because I'll be honest with you, my human reaction was this. This morning, I had to wake up extra early to watch a title fight from Japan with Inoue and Fulton. I'm doing the Coach JB show, and at that point, my phone starts buzzing. And the big story was that LeBronny James, who you would figure for his age is a world-class athlete, has been a public figure, collapses from cardiac arrest. And based on everything that you said about some of the decisions and the statements that LeBron James has made, I'm, I'll be blunt. It's the first thing I thought of. Was he vaxxed? So the first thing that I think of and why <clears throat> I, I'm a tiny bit hesitant to talk about the vac the vax thing is is because I think it's it's all speculative one, but two, and I'll lead in the speculation. The cynic in me doesn't think for one second LeBron James and his family took the vaccine. And, and if they did, LeBron's dumber than I thought. I, I, I thought LeBron early on expressed some vaccine hesitancy that, <clears throat> that I thought was smart and the right instincts. And I've always assumed that uh, mm. LeBron never took the vax and that he said that he did because that's what you have to do out in Hollywood. And if you're a celebrity and you're an influencer, but it, it, it's very difficult for me to believe that LeBron James, as great athlete as he is, as genetically blessed as he is, uh, why would he take the vax? And then, Lord have mercy, why would he let his young children, anybody with any common sense, knows that this COVID thing had no impact on young people and LeBron, with all his wealth and everything, I, I just assume no way his boys or little girl or wife took the vaccine. And, and I, I just sincerely believe that. Or, or LeBron is just dumber than I thought. Hmm. Well, we're back to the uh, conspiracy theories again. I, I mean, we, I, I look, is that the craziest, wackiest thing? to think or to hypothesize? Probably not. But it goes beyond brawny. It, it's the whole movement of what, or the messaging that we are seeing. If you go on Twitter, you go on any form of social media, there are dedicated accounts to talking about otherwise healthy, relatively young people just simply collapsing, like that soccer announcer that I talked about on ESPN that just keeled over Right before I came on, I saw an old tweet of his or a message where he's pushing people to get vaxxed. That's where that is why people all over the world 
are saying, wait a minute, we have to be suspicious of this whole thing, is at what point do your medical decisions start to impede on mine? And I'll tell you when they do. When you start telling me when I should do it, why I should do it, and when you try to give me a guilty conscience. And, you know, one of the great things about walking away from ESPN when I did, my last day was October 31st, 2020, is that I did not have that decision to make. You either get vaxxed or you keep your job, or you can't travel to do your job. And I'll I'll be the first to tell you, I I don't ever plan on getting the vaccine. I haven't gotten it thus far. I don't feel as though I needed it. I'm someone that had COVID once. I got through it. I'm still alive. I feel as though I'm in the best shape of my life. So there's there's things about that vaccine that I did not like. And I also felt it was unnecessary given my personal physical fitness. But again, I would never tell anyone that they shouldn't, though. That's where I draw the line. It's like, this is my choice with my body. Remember that? My choice, my body. Funny how it applies to certain things, but not others. But anyway, um, I would never. I, in fact, you know what? I don't even want to ever wear a mask again. And I find it odd when I'm driving down the road. I see a guy, relatively young people, walking their dogs with a mask or someone at a ball game, 60,000 people with a mask. And I'm thinking to myself, you know what, though? I cannot be hypocritical. That is their choice, not mine. Steve, I'm right there with you. And and I'm someone that is overweight, but I was not going to take the vax. Uh, I was going to rely on the system that God gave me and, and, you know, some advice from Dr. Zelensky, God rest his soul, uh, and the z pack and just taking vitamin D, vitamin D and zinc and, yep. and, and, and the z pack and, and, you know, when I did get uh, COVID, Dr. Zelensky sent me ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine and I recovered within 36 hours, mostly. Uh, there was some brain fog that, you know, lingered around for a couple of weeks. But other than that, I had a bad headache for a day, and that started to dissipate as soon as I took the ivermectin and, and hydroxychloroquine. And, and I haven't looked back since, taken the z pack virtually every day since. Um, and so I... I, 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 do, I look at me, if I'm in my 50s and, and in the risk categories and LeBron James is one of the greatest athletes of all time, keeps himself in supreme shape and, and has a, had the initial skepticism about the vaccine, it's hard for me to believe that they actually talked him into taking it and then <laughs> talked his kids into taking it. And again, I don't know what schools his kids were going to. Maybe his son couldn't play on the basketball team if he didn't take the vax. But even at that, I would think they would have found out a way to fake the vaccine. I know plenty of people that paid a hundred bucks uh, to get the fake vax or you know, to get some nurse to squirt uh, the vax into a trash can and say they gave it to him. I just assume that's what these athletes with all this money and resources did. And so th- th- that's why I'm a little bit uncomfortable just assuming that this is vax related. And th- that goes a little bit with my discomfort with, with Jamie Foxx. It's like all that money, all that access, and Jamie Foxx took the vax? Really? It's, it's I just, I, I think, I don't think Joe Biden took the vax. I don't, I don't think any of these, uh, half these people that are pretending to have taken the vax, I don't believe they have, but again, I could be wrong, and we're certainly having that discussion today about Bronny James. I see myocarditis is trending over Twitter X, and everybody's talking about whether Bronny James took the vax. Jason. I'm going to have to, I'd have to see some definitive proof. You know what? I see the blood work before I believe it. Well, okay. Here's the unfortunate part: we will never get honest, fair coverage of this because when these companies, these pharmaceutical corporations, are buying millions and billions of dollars of ad space, they are basically saying we are now censoring you. So this issue becomes a huge elephant in the room. 
watch any sporting event and eventually you will see these companies advertising. So I, I, I look at this in different ways. When the athletes were told to be inside the bubble and to play during that period of time, you had to be vaccinated, right? Or you went through a different set of protocols like Aaron Rodgers. Well, number one, now that becomes marketing. These players are not just lab rats. They're satisfied customers, right? So then if anything happens, the, now the news, now the news department of these networks, and they're like, oh, wait a minute, they just paid $3.2 billion for ad space for the next six months. Hmm. And, and so now it becomes this really uncomfortable truth between news, editorial, and then the advertising department and business. And so it's just this thing where we will never actually get real honest coverage. And Jason, I'm not going to lie to you. Anytime I see one of these stories on Twitter, I make sure I retweet it because I feel as though that's just one small contribution that I can make to letting people know, hey, guys, um, don't judge me. I won't judge you. But this is what's going on. You can decipher for yourself what you think is taking place. Steve, great job as always. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow. That's Steve Kim. Uh, I hear tomorrow playing. That means we'll see you tomorrow. Waiting for the countdown, coming off the breakdown, standing in line for freedom. Looking for a breakout, feeling like a standoff, nothing in life like freedom. Came like a fighter, striking like a ladder, making all this moves for freedom. I want freedom. No negotiation, my system, no relation, we all just want to have freedom. Sitting on the corner, never been alone, I'm breaking my back for freedom. Bless, we are living, get back, we are receiving, all receiving, we all want to be free. We want freedom. I just want, I wanna be, I just want, I wanna be, I just want, I wanna be, I just want.